Next, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Ron Sun, uh, Professor of Cognitive Science and Computer Science at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, author of Anatomy of the Mind, winner of the David Marr Award from the Cognitive Science Society, and the 2008 Hebb Award from the International Neural Networks Society. I'm looking forward very much to the talk. But where is my speaker? I'm here. Online. There he is. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for the invitation. I'll be discussing neural symbolic models, due process theories, and computational cognitive architectures, their relevance and their relationships to each other. It will be mainly about some historical backgrounds and their relevance to uh, the current and future research in these areas. Neural networks and deep learnings are good at many things. Uh, they achieved some spectacular successes in recent years. I don't need to enumerate those successes. Everyone knows them. But they have shortcomings and limitations, despite their popularity. And uh, with these uh, shortcomings, uh, people have noticed that neural networks and symbolic models have complementary strengths. Therefore, Meaning these two types of models may be advantageous. Uh, the resulting model may be more capable, more versatile, more expressive, and so on. This immediately harkens back to the 1990s when such models first emerged. Even before that time, at the beginning of the connectionism, the current the, 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 the most recent wave of connectionism, namely the 1980s, theoretical criticism of connectionist paradigm point to the need for combining the two paradigms. For example, the very well-known critiques by uh, Photo and Perlitian, Pinker and Prince, and so on. So uh, this is not new. I mean, the old becomes new again. And uh, over time, uh, such models have been uh, variously known as uh, neural symbolic models, connectionist symbolic models, hybrid symbolic neural networks, or simply hybrid models. Here are some uh, books from that bygone era. Just for some uh, nostalgic reasons, I uh, listed three of them. There are, of course, uh, many more. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the first book, Simon Bookman, 1994, was the first book on this topic, neural symbolic models. Now, um, are these books still relevant? Notice that these are edited volumes. That means uh, many authors contributed to these books, and those books contained many different models. And one contribution of these books is the analoging of techniques for combining neural and symbolic models. So, uh, for example, uh, here are a couple of pages from these books. Uh, they are one approach to develop hybrid neural symbolic models is developing specialized, structured, localist networks for symbolic processing, for example, today's uh, uh, graphic neural networks, all performing symbolic processing distributed neural networks in a holistic way. Uh, LLMs of today uh, basically belong to this category. Or we can combine separate symbolic and neural network modules. Most today's uh, models inspired by due process theories belong to this category. And of course, there are other approaches. In terms of the whole system, uh, it can be a single module system, in which case you can uh, talk about the representation uh, of, uh, of that 
module and the mapping between symbols and the representations. Or it can be a multi-module system, in which case uh, it can be heterogeneous. You can talk about different combinations of different components and their coupling and their granularity. Or it can be homogeneous, of course. So there are many different ways of combining symbolic processing and neural networks. Many of them, however, appear ad hoc or task specific or otherwise problematic. So how can we produce better models going forward? Recall that this uh, line of work has been going on since the 1990s. How should we best structure such models? How do we structure them in a principled and uh, theoretically justified way? Of course, it's preferable that we can develop a model from some uh, solid first principles or fundamental laws. I argued back then, and I'm still arguing today in the 2020s, that a better approach is structuring them in a cognitively motivated way that is based on the human cognitive architecture which is in turn based on psychology, neuroscience, and so on. In particular, within the human cognitive architecture, we need to take into account due process theories or two system theories. Uh, for example, uh, the implicit versus explicit, system one versus system two, intuition versus reason, and so on. Due process theory, I would argue, can provide both philosophical and psychological justifications for some neurosymbolic models. They constitute both theoretical and the empirical grounding for neurosymbolic models. Uh, instead of uh, launching into a full-scale defense of uh, due process theory, which I don't have time to do, or a complete literature review, uh, which is out of question also, let me just uh, pre present a few quotes. For example, here is a quote from Immanuel Kant. Thoughts without intuitions are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. And that's probably the first uh, due process theory that I know of. And uh, here are some related quotes. Logic is one thing and a common sense another. And we of course. Logic remains barren unless fertilized by intuition. And uh, you can also trace back to William James' distinction between empirical thinking and true reasoning, uh, Heidegger's uh, similar distinction in a completely different vocabulary, of course. And there's a large body of uh, experimental work in psychology concerning implicit versus explicit memory or implicit versus explicit learning. They demonstrate empirically the dissociation between the two types of uh, processes. Uh, here's uh, my version of our uh, cognitive processes are carried out in two distinct levels with qualitatively different mechanisms. Each level encodes a set of knowledge for its processing and the coverage of two sets overlap uh, substantially. That is, the two levels encode similar contents, but they encode their contents in different ways. For example, sim symbolic versus sub-symbolic and so on. And therefore different mechanisms are involved for their processing and they have different flavors, for example, different degrees of uh, accessibility. So one is uh, more explicit than the other one. And these different levels can potentially work together synergistically. They can complement each other in various ways. And that's why, that's probably why nature chose this design. I refer to, refer these two points as the due representation hypothesis, which goes beyond just due processes, but due uh, representation, uh, synergy hypothesis. So here is uh, another 
more recent due process theory by Kahneman. Kahneman actually uh, popularized uh, due process theory uh, with his uh, 2011 book. According to him, there are two systems of processing. System one or intuition, typically fast, automatic, effortless, associative, implicit, and emotionally charged. Gov two or reasoning is slower, serial, effortful, more likely to be consciously monitored and controlled. Rel relatively flexible and potentially rule governed. Evans also espoused a similar view. According to him, system one is a rapid, parallel, automatic in nature. And system two is slow, sequential, and makes use of central working memory system. Permits abstract hypothetical thinking that cannot be achieved by system one. Furthermore, Evans uh, proposed that the relationship between the two systems is that of uh, default and intervention. That is, system one forms the default response unless there is a inter intervention from system two. This is opposed to other possibilities, for example, parallel operations of system one and two or system two first, then system one later, uh, or some other possibilities. And some of these characterizations of due processes appear uh, problematic. They seem to be a little too uh, simplistic. Uh, looking back at the relevant empirical evidence, we see that Intuition can be very slow, not necessarily faster. Intuition can be subject to conscious control and manipulation and not entirely automatic. And uh, explicit thinking can be engaged right from the beginning and not necessarily an occasional intervention and so on. So we need to achieve a more nuanced understanding of the two processes, not just the broad stroke depiction as in the, in the book by Kahneman, uh, uh, as in a pop science kind of way. So we need to ask many relevant questions in order to determine, for example, uh, fast versus slow processes and so on. For example, here are the, some questions. How deep is the pro process? For example, degrees of precision, certain how much information is involved. And what is the quality of available information? How incomplete or inconsistent is that information? How typical or atypical is the current situation to be addressed? And so on and so forth. And furthermore, we can also figure out, is the process procedural or declarative? That's a distinction very well established in psychology. Uh, procedural refers to uh, processes concerning action. And declarative uh, refers to processes concerning uh, a general factual knowledge and the, and the inference and retrieval of them. And what is the relationship between the implicit, explicit distinction and the procedural declarative distinction? What are the mechanisms behind these type of processes and so on? So in other words, we need to take into account structural and mechanistic nuances of the human mind instead of simply adopting conventional wisdom that happens to be popular at the time and the complexity of the matter should be adequately taken into account, especially for any computational theories that purport to value psychological realism. Answers to these questions can lead to resolution of issuing those questionable claims that I mentioned earlier. So we need a, a overall theoretical framework, as well as detailed computational models 
uh, to to investigate those uh, issues. So we need a computational cognitive architecture, which is a broadly scoped domain generic computational psychological model capturing the essential structures, mechanisms, and processes of the mind, uh, which can be used for broadly scoped, multi-domain, multi-level analysis of behavior. And that's my definition of uh, psychologically realistic computational cognitive architecture. And at this conference, I'm sure everyone has his or her own definition of cognitive architecture, but my emphasis here is psychologically realistic cognitive architecture. With that in mind, I will proceed with this definition. The current cognitive architecture is uh, a due process and due representation cognitive architecture involving both symbolic and neural representations and processes. So neurosymbolic combination is a key aspect of this cognitive architecture. And the role of a cognitive architecture is to provide a general framework to facilitate more detailed exploration of the human mind, the mechanisms and processes of various functionalities of the human mind through specifying computational details of some essential uh, psychological mechanisms and processes. And in this process, we develop theories of cognition of human mind in general in computer algorithms and programs. And therefore, we can run simulations. And the results of the simulation can be compared with uh, logical experimental data or neuroscience data that serve the purpose of validation. And in case of discrepancy, then we can refine the model. And that's how we make progress. And that's the idea of computational psychology. So uh, let's look into the carrying cognitive architecture in a little bit more detail so that we can see how it may help to answer those questions about due process theory. And in turn, it can help to, uh, to improve uh, neurosymbolic models. First of all, there's a division between procedural and declarative processes, as I mentioned earlier, which is very well established in psychology. So I don't need to uh, get more into it. I recall John Layer's earlier talk also mentioned that distinction. And then there's a distinction between implicit and explicit processes, which is also very well established given the popularity of Kahneman's book in recent years. But I will make two further distinctions. One is between implicit and explicit procedural processes, and the other is between implicit and explicit declarative processes. So there will be a four-way uh, division here. And the symbolic or localist representation is used for capturing explicit knowledge and a connection of distributed representation, nowadays known as embedding, is used for capturing implicit processes. So that representational difference pro provides uh, a substrate for that distinction. In other words, it provides a, a one possible magnistic uh, explanation for that distinction. Furthermore, here are some auxiliary uh, principles. Uh, beyond the reactive uh, 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 processes, there's also a motivational and metacognitive control and various memory systems, uh, which also uh, touched upon in John Layer's talk earlier today. And motivation is very important. Uh, we need to address motivation beyond just uh, goals or reinforcement. We need to address the process by which goals are determined or reinforcements are, are detected and so on and so forth. In other words, we need to trace them back to the essential human needs. And since this is not, my, not the focus of today's talk, so I'm not, not gonna get into the detail here. So here is the diagram of the four major subsystems of carrion. 
Uh, ACS is the action center subsystem, which deals with uh, procedural processes. And NACS is a non-action centered subsystem, which deals with uh, uh, declarative processes. And then there is the MS or motivational subsystem and MCS or metacognitive subsystem. Within each subsystem, uh, the top level, a set of uh, modules uh, deal with uh, explicit processes. At the bottom level, another set of modules deals with uh, implicit processes. And these two levels operate in parallel and they are tightly coupled, interact with each other. And uh, these four subsystems also interact with each other constantly. And uh, let's look into the technical detail very quickly. Um, um, so the action center sub subsystem for procedural processes, uh, the implicit pr procedural processes within that subsystem is captured by uh, neural networks and explicit procedural processes are captured by explicit symbolic action rules. It's similar in other uh, subsystem. And so I'm not gonna get into the details, except that I wanna mention that in the motivational subsystem, implicit processes deal with uh, drives or basic motives or needs. And explicit processes deal with uh, explicit goals uh, with the neural networks and the rules and so on and so forth. And there's a dual representation present in each subsystem. Each concept, for example, is represented by an individual node at the top level and represented by distributed representation at the bottom level or embedding at the bottom level. And once the uh, the top level uh, node representation is activated, the corresponding distributed representation is also activated, which is known as the implicitation of explicit information. In the other direction, from the bottom level distributed representation, we can have uh, top level explicit representation activated, which is uh, explicitation of implicit information. And similarly, we can have uh, bottom up learning or top down learning. In other words, information flows from the bottom level to the top level or from the top level to the bottom level using, for example, online knowledge extraction for bottom-up learning and through online reinforcement learning uh, for top-down uh, learning process. And uh, these are just uh, the existence proof showing that those principles that I mentioned earlier can be implemented computationally. And there are many possible extensions and updates very similar to what John Laird uh, mentioned earlier, a uh, large language model can be used. For example, they can be used to capture implicit declarative processes. In other words, capturing human intuition, which is delivered in a linguistic form from uh, LLMs, from sublinguistic or sub-symbolic processing within it. Uh, address intuitive refraction, intuitive reasoning, intuitive planning, and so on. But they can be enhanced by various forms of memory, by motivational metacognitive control, by explicit symbolic processing, and so on. These are all part of carrier, but they are external to large language model. So by incorporating them, I mean large language models into carrier, into the bottom level of the NACS, we can uh, improve the performance of carrying and also improve the performance of large language models. For example, explicit deliberation at the top level of the NACS can guide the intuitive reasoning and planning at the bottom level performed by LLMs. And they also, I mean, the top level can also perform explicit exact reasoning, for example, from the first principles, uh, strictly logical reasoning and so on. And uh, the mapping from the localist representation to distributed representation at the bottom level becomes 
prompt engineering, mostly. And in the same way, large language model can also be used to capture implicit procedural processes at the bottom level of the ACS. And the large language models can be helped by a various form of memory and a metacognitive, metaco and a metacognitive uh, and motivational control by explicit symbolic processes and so on, which are all part of carrium, as mentioned earlier. In addition, we also tried some other ways. For example, uh, convolutional neural network can be used as a perceptual module. Uh, lang large language model can, can also be used for that purpose. And the lang large language model can be used as a feature detection modules or linguistic generation modules and so on. So that's about implementation. Now, going back to the psychological validity of the cognitive architecture, in words, the cognitive architecture as a generic psychological theory, uh, I will refer you to these publications. These are the representative publication among other publications. And they demonstrated the psychological validity and uh, its application to, 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 to uh, addressing psychological issues. And these are the books relevant to the cognitive architecture. Uh, the first book, Anatomy of the Mind, is, is, a, is a, a most recent book published in 2016. It's already seven years old, so but it has a more up-to-date con uh, content, details of the cognitive architecture. And the other book, 1994 book, was the one in which I proposed my own version of due process theory, as I mentioned earlier. Now, given this cognitive architecture, we can address those questions in a detailed, mechanistic, and process-oriented way. For example, in relation to the speed, fast versus slow, uh, we can ask when are multiple processing cycles are needed in the model and what determines the number of cycles, including those factors that I mentioned earlier, then we can decide on uh, which one is faster. So we use the simulation as the uh, a way of theoretical interpretation on because simulation provides uh, a more detailed uh, magnistic interpretation. So in, in terms of uh, fast versus slow process, now based on Clarion, we can address that question concerning procedural processes. Is it true that implicit processes are faster than explicit processes? The answer is uh, yes, it's generally true using the theoretical interpretations through Clarion. With regard to declarative processes, those within the NACS, is it true that implicit processes are faster than explicit processes? The answer is it's generally not true. It determined by various factors, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, the a uh, broad stroke characterization by some of these uh, due process theory that I mentioned earlier is wrong. Uh, so I can show you some examples of those simulation, but the question is how much time do I have? I lost track of time. Anybody? Yeah, you have uh, 10 minutes with leave, five minutes for questions. Uh, 10 minutes plus five minutes. Yes. Okay. Uh, in that case, I can't really get into simulation of psychological experiments and how the simulation based on Clarion provides uh, convincing interpretations, things like that. So let me sk uh, skip those uh, details. Uh, let me just mention that in due process theory, there are a number of uh, uh, notions uh, not very clear, uh, clearly defined. 
uh, they are focused psychological. Uh, for example, instinct or intuition and so on. And the parent cognitive architecture, besides providing computational simulation, it can also be used at a theoretical level, provides uh, theoretical interpretations of these folk psychological notions in a more magnetic and uh, clearer way. For example, uh, instinct for action is mostly captured by implicit proce procedural processes within the ACS, captured by neural networks and so on. And the causal chain goes from the stimuli from external environment to drives, which are the motives or needs that I mentioned earlier, which leads to the setting of a goal. And uh, it then uh, in turn leads to action. So in other words, uh, uh, action selection is mostly done through implicit processes, although it may become explicit also. And the reflex is also mostly implicit procedural processes, but it's uh, it has a simpler causal chain. It goes from stimuli to action immediately without going through the motivational processes. And the intuition is captured by implicit declarative processes mostly. Uh, the causal chain goes from uh, stimuli to drives, motives, which leads to the setting of a goal which leads to action. In this case, it amounts to executive control, invoking the implicit declarative processes. It, it's complementary to explicit reasoning. Explicit reasoning, uh, as listed here, it's very similar, except that uh, different components was involved. So the, uh, the use of computational cognitive architecture is that it can lead to better, more nuanced understanding of due processes, which in turn can lead to better neural symbolic system. The methodology of developing computational cognitive architecture that is based on empirical data or findings from psychology, neuroscience, and so on, based on the convergence of many pieces of evidence this methodology can constitute a principal way of developing neural symbolic system also. I would argue that this is a good way of developing neural symbolic system, both for theoretical purposes or for practical applications. For theoretical purposes, its advantage include ensuring psychological realism, which can also help, help us better understanding the human mind. For practical applications, its advantage may include leading to systems more similar to humans. It's, uh, those systems will be more easily understood by humans and vice versa. Easier communication between humans and machines. So let me uh, quickly summarize uh, the, the points that I've made so far. Due processes, have significant implications for developing computational cognitive architectures and neural symbolic models. If psychological realism is what one wants to achieve in computational modeling or in any computational systems, due process theories must be taken into account. And due process theories can serve as a theoretical basis and justifications for some computational cognitive architecture and cognitively motivated neural symbolic models. Recent developments of deep learning, large language model, convolutional neural network, and so on, do not invalidate these points at all, but only strengthen these points. While due process theories are popular right now, some issues involved, for example, relatively, relative speeds between the two type of processes, intention control, and interaction between them are more complex than often assumed. These issues are important in developing cognitive architectures and in turn 
computational cognitive architectures can help in disentangling these issues and other theoretically important issues. Together, they can lead to better cognitively motivated neurosymbolic models, which are both principled and uh, psychologically realistic. And the Clarion cognitive architecture aims to be an integrative and comprehensive computational framework of the human mind, encompassing many different representations, mechanisms, and processes, covering many different domains. And it provides a more nuanced view of the due processes. And it goes beyond the narrowly defined notion of cognition uh, by including the motivational underpinning of behavior so that we can achieve uh, truly autonomous uh, systems or agents. And I would argue that understanding intelligence and cognition, both natural and artificial kinds, require no less than such a comprehensive model. And due processes and neurosymbolic integrations are crucial. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Who's doing the mic? Okay. Hello. Um, uh, I have a, one short question about, uh, uh, you mentioned the psychological realism, and uh, I haven't got your opinion on neurobiological realism. From my perspective, any process or processes uh, psychological processes or models must be mapped to the neurobiological uh, nature of that. Otherwise, uh, I'm well. We have to say brain doesn't work like that. So, what is your opinion on neurobiological realism? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I got that question uh, multiple multiple times before. So, uh, how do I address this? Um, in science, there's a notion of a level of abstraction and different theories, different experimental works are often at a particular level of abstraction. And for the current cognitive architecture and for many other cognitive architectures, the level of abstraction in focus is the level of psychology and uh, psychology deals mostly with behavior without dealing with the uh, neural uh, underpinning of uh, uh, those mechanisms, but deal with the mechanisms at a more abstract level. Is that kind of uh, theory needed? Is that uh, unnecessary? Can we do without that, just rely on neural science theories and the models? My answer to these questions would be no, uh, because uh, neuroscience, uh, I mean, despite the tremendous progress in uh, recent decades, is still limited. And we need other approaches to, 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 uh, uh, to help us to understand the human mind. Um, notice my focus is on the human mind, not on the human brain. So in other words, I aim for a more abstract, a higher level understanding. And uh, well, even if you understand every neural biological detail, you still need some uh, high level understanding, high level theory to describe the working, the emergent properties of these uh, neural circuits. So uh, so this kind of theory is not only needed, uh, it's probably uh, the best approach right now, given the limitations of neuroscience uh, understanding of the human mind. And what do you feel then uh, to about uh, this kind of understanding of the, uh, of the um, how do I put that, complexity of the problem of the intelligence uh, if I say that we have to have unified theory 
uh, that will be unified in philosophical, psychological, neurobiological, and any other perspective or levels of abstractions. Otherwise, we are doomed not to have unified theory of intelligence and not to have a, a complete understanding from the level of molecule to the level of high level phenomena like cognition or um, consciousness. Uh, uh, because we will be doomed to just having the series falling apart. The situation that we have at the moment, when psychological series models, they don't match neurobiology. They don't work like, the brain doesn't work like that. We have this situation at the moment. Thank you. A very interesting point, uh, the integration of uh, philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience is that is something that I've been uh, interested in all along. And to these uh, three disciplines, I would also add social science, for example, uh, behavioral economics, um, uh, even uh, cognitive anthropology, cognitive sociology, and so on and so forth. These are all very related, and they all need to be taken into consideration. And uh, as I said, uh, a grand unification is uh, is the ultimate goal, but we are not at that point yet. We should work towards that, but at this point, we should not um, uh, uh, disparage neuroscience model in favor of uh, a psychological model or disparaging psychological model in favor of neuroscience model. All of these levels of abstractions are needed and uh, we need to work towards the uh, unified theory, and, uh, but we're not there yet. Well, let me give you another uh, 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 example. Uh, you may say to understand a car, an automobile, you need to understand all the mechanical parts and mechanical theory underlying the operation. And, but this mechanical theory needs to be mapped onto quantum theory and uh, because everything is ultimately reduced to quantum theory. And uh, so a theory about the operation of a car is not complete unless you map to quantum theory. Uh, yes and no, because there is a mapping between uh, Newtonian physics and, uh, and the quantum physics but not in every case you need to map a theory to the quantum theory. And uh, every theory at every level may have its own use. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, those very interesting questions used up all our time. So I'm afraid we're gonna to have to switch to the next speaker.